Good evening. My name is Andrea Varela, and I am the Community Outreach Coordinator for Rural Arizona Engagement. I want to thank you for joining us tonight for Redistricting 101, Drawing a Just Democracy. Here at RAISE, we believe in civic engagement, voter education, and advocacy work with the fundamental belief that empowerment equals existence. When our communities are empowered with knowledge, they sit in the room where decisions are made. So thank you again. If you are not following us on social media already, please do so. Our handles are at Rural AZ Engage. And with that, I am going to pass it off to my co-host, Aris Correa. And if you would, please mute your, um, mute your mics. There will be time for questions um, during this presentation where you can unmute yourself and ask those questions. Also, if you have any questions while we're going through, uh, you can type them in the chat as well, and we will monitor that. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Aris Correa. Uh, I'm the Advo Advocacy Director for Rural Arizona Engagement. I'm very excited to be here, so I guess we'll just dive in into this sort of very dense uh, info that we're going to present today, but I'm again very excited about the topic. Um, today's objectives are going to be defining redistricting, uh, discussing the Voting Rights Act and how it affects redistricting, defining gerryma gerrymandering and how to proactively fight against it. We're going to discuss the AZ mapping process and criteria. We're going to discuss Arizona's redistricting updates, and we're going to also talk about how you can participate in the process. So uh, we've had the census, it's now over. What's the next step, now what? Census data is used in congressional apportionment distribution of federal funding, and it helps create a more modern and equitable society. Congressional apportionment is used to determine at a federal level how many congressional districts a state should draw and how many residents a district should contain. Uh, currently, Arizona has nine congressional districts, and uh, based on the census data, there's a possibility that we could gain an additional district this cycle. Um, here are the current Arizona district maps that have been in effect since 2012. Um, on the left side, we can see uh, the legislative districts. Uh, we have a total of 30 here each district uh, having uh, in Arizona rep two representatives and a senator that represents that specific district. Um, we can see that Pinal is uh, down here and we have LD8, the little brown area there. And then we also have a little bit of LD11, the yellow that runs there uh, through Pinal. On the right side of the screen, we have our congressional districts. Um, we have a total of nine right now, and we can also see here uh, Pinal is part of Congressional District 1, and that includes uh, typically a lot of uh, people would call the rural areas. We have uh, the Navajo um, counties, Apache County, Copenino, and so that's just a kind of idea of where we're at right now. So what is redistricting? After apportionment comes redistricting, and redistricting is the process in which the new congressional and state legislative districts are drawn. Um, district boundaries should ensure equal and proportional representation and make sure that each voice is represented fairly. Uh, redistricting is important because how these district lines are drawn influences who runs for public office and who can get elected. And again, Arizona has nine congressional districts and 30 legislative districts. So far, are there any questions? I don't see any in the chat right now. All right, just drop them in the chat or unmute if you need to, we can keep moving on. So an important aspect of this process deals with the Voting Rights Act. Um, fair maps must take into account the Voting Rights Act, which protects communities of color during all stages of the electoral process. And this includes the drawing of maps. 
Section two of the Voting Rights Act is a nationwide prohibition against voting practices and procedures that discriminate against uh, on the basis of race, color, or membership of a language minority group. Um, the reason uh, we have this act that um, is based on the fact that even with the 15th Amendment after the Civil War in the South, um, states amended their constitution to, dis to disclude African Americans and other minorities from voting. Uh, the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965 and addressed discriminatory election rules um, to ensure that our legislatures at all levels reflected the racial and ethnic diversity of the people that they represent. So with some of these rules, um, we are trying to draw a map. Ideally, we want a map that is uh, more fair or proportionate to the electorate. electorate. So there's no right or um, perfect map, uh, but there are some things that that would represent a fair map, and this is what we're advocating for. Um, the first part that we're advocating for is that we wanna make sure that these maps are drawn in transparency, that people are aware of what's going on and are not shut out of the process. Um, the second aspect is making sure that there's meaningful public input um, so people can participate in that process. Uh, step number three, is we want maps that take into account minority communities and make sure that those communities are empowered. And number four, um, these types of maps or more fair maps will create district boundaries in which elected officials are more responsive to the voters. Um, a, a definition, uh, something that we want to define is majority minority districts. These districts, um, these are districts that contain a majority of a racial or linguistic minority population, and this is protected by the Voting Rights Act. Um, in these districts, um, we have a situation where we have a, a minority group um, that vote, they might be a smaller amount in a state. Uh, we, still we still wanna make sure that they're represented overall in that state. So the courts have found that the, fo the following four criteria must be met to create one of these majority minority districts. The minority group has to be sufficiently large enough and geographically concentrated to make a majority in a district. The minority group has to be politically cohesive, meaning that the individuals that make up this group vote in similar patterns and typically vote for the same candidates. Um, also, uh, we have a situation where typically white majority votes together to defeat the minority preferred candidates. And when those situations happen, given the totality of circumstances, the minority group has less opportunity than other members of the electorate to participate in the electoral process and elect representatives that, uh, of its choice. Communities of interest, another item that we'd like to define, a community of interest or COI is a group of people with a common set of concerns or interests that should be represented in a single district for the purpose of ensuring fair and effective representation. This is not formally defined at the federal or state level. Um, communities of interest can self-identify common needs or interests, or they can officially organize themselves. Um, they uh, advocate for their shared interest uh, uh, on why they should be in like their own specific district. And often uh, they share common interests with a goal of policy, a focus on policy that would positively impact that group. So these could be um, a community based on education, maybe type of employment, urban rural needs, um, could be possibly like maybe a farming area or a farming community. They might consider themselves a community of interest and want to make sure that they're voicing how um, their needs and maybe how they should be drawn into the whole process. Uh, it could also be maybe a, a business community or an area where there tends to be a certain type of business done. Um, so these are all possible examples of communities of interest. Now that we have discussed a little bit about redistricting, um, we want to go into gerrymandering. So gerrymandering is the process of drawing district lines 
so that a political party or other group can gain power without actually winning a majority of the vote in their state. It's important to note that the Voting Rights Act that we discussed protects against both political and racial gerrymandering. So here we have an example of a gerrymandered district. This in 2012 was Pennsylvania's seventh congressional district. And this was an example of political gerrymandering. So 49% of voters voted Republican and over 50% of voters voted Democrat. But out of the 18 seats, only five went to Democrats and 13 went to Republicans. This means that the vote was spread out and essentially cracked. So there was no majority um, to gain these seats. Now, it's important to note here too that the legislature in this case was responsible for the drawing of the district lines, the congressional and legislative district lines. And so um, drawing these lines in a legislature, both Republicans and Democrats and other um, political or groups or other organized groups all have their own interests in mind. And so it's always important for you to advocate for your community of interests because sometimes um, your voice is not heard. So in this case, in the seventh congressional district uh, in Pennsylvania, it thwarted the voice of the voters. And this was done by the legislature. In Arizona, as we will discuss in a little bit, we have an independent commission state, which means our legislature does not draw these lines. As we can see in that district, gerrymandering skews election results, makes races less competitive and thwarts the will of the voters. Gerrymandering is a form of cheating at redistricting because drawing these different districts produces different electorates. Drawing districts in different ways um, is essentially a way to ensure that one group gains power over another in an unfair way. When gerrymandering occurs, representation isn't collective of the community and the state, and voters feel that their voices don't matter. When we are doing redistricting work, it's always important to keep in mind gerrymandering and the implications that it causes. And we always want to proactively fight against this in all of our efforts and our education. Packing and cracking are two specific tactics to gerrymander a district. And by packing and cracking, um, this produces results that are not proportionate to the electorate. So packing occurs when groups are entirely packed into one district with weird borders, but have no presence in other districts. Minority voters are compressed into a small number of districts when they could effectively control more. And similar communities of interest are so condensed that they don't have the ability or power to influence other elected officials or districts. So if we look at this example here, it's going to be an example of packing. So on the left, we have this blank kind of state. In this state, there are 30 wards, 60% of the blue ward are blue wards and 40% are gray wards. So that is how we're starting off in this blank state. If we move to the middle image, we can see that there are three districts. There are 10 wards in each district, which would meet the population criteria. However, they are packed and this is why. There are two gray districts. So right here on the top and right here on the bottom. So there are six gray wards to four blue wards. In the middle, this blue district, there's so the blue voters are completely condensed into this middle district. There are no gray wards, which means that the majority in this district will be blue. However, the majority in the outer two districts will not be. 
This is not proportionate to electorate because if you can see where we started, the majority of board of wards in the state were blue. However, they only have effect over one district here. If we move on to the third image, this is more of a proportional outcome because there are two blue districts and one gray district. Again, if we look at them, they meet the population criteria. Each of the three districts has 10 wards. However, you can see here on the right and on the bottom that there are nine blue wards to one gray ward. And then we have a gray district to the left. This is proportional because as I said, we started with the majority of blue wards here in this state and they have more of a voice when they are districted in the proportional outcome way. So now that we've discussed cracking, pack, uh, packing, I'm sorry, cracking is another way to manipulate maps. This happens when a community is split into several different districts and doesn't hold majority in any of them. This spreads minority voters thinly into many districts. And because they do not hold the majority, they lose the ability to advocate for their own needs and be effective. Cracking does not allow for minority voters to elect someone of their choice that can represent their own communities of interest. So just like we looked at an example of packing, we are now going to look at an example of cracking. So again, on the left, we are going to start with kind of a blank state. There are again, 30 wards. However, this time 60% of the wards are gray and 40% of the wards are blue. If we move on to the middle image, there are three gray districts and zero blue districts. This means that out of these 40%, the blue wards were cracked into these three districts. Now, now that may look like they're compact and contiguous and it does meet population criteria. However, this is a form of gerrymandering again because the minority voters were cracked into three districts, which means one, they can't affect representation of their choosing. And two, they don't have any impact um, on who will be elected and represent their communities of interest. The third kind of graph that we have here is again, a proportional outcome, which would be two gray districts to one blue district. Again, we meet the population criteria. There are 10 wards in each of these three districts. However, in two wards, the gray is the majority and in one ward, the blue is the majority. Again, this is more proportional because where we started, the majority of wards in the state were gray. However, this is proportional because both the gray wards and the blue wards have an opportunity to affect their own representation and elect um, individuals that will represent their communities of interest. As I stated before, it is so important to keep in mind gerrymandering and how it works um, in redistricting because redistricting is so consequential in your representation and how your voice is heard. And so we always want to end um, gerrymandering and fight against it. I know this is a lot, so we're going to stop for some questions here. You can go ahead and throw them in the chat or unmute yourself um, and we can go ahead and answer some of those. Hi, this is Pete Rios. I have a question, if you wish to take it. Yes, of course, Pete. Hi, welcome. Yeah, and, and I think this one goes more to Mr. Correa and uh, the Justice Department and uh, what used to be pre-clearance. And he was talking about the Voting Rights Act, Section 2 and Section 5, which are very important, except that Arizona for many, many, many years had been declared 
by the federal government and the Justice Department, a preclearance state. We are no longer a preclearance right. state. Right. Can he address that in respect to sharing information with the others as to why that happened? Hello. Yeah, so yeah, so we had uh, the Voting Rights Act, uh, Section 2, and then Section 5. Section 5 addressed um, that issue, um, and it was the, the act's way of determining which states would have to pass a preclearance on the on the districts that they they drew, um, that that essentially that that section, uh, along with section two, which which tells us that um, these districts can't be drawn to exclude other um, other groups, uh, racially uh, racial minority groups, and section five was the that added on to that that allowed the Justice Department to to make sure that that wasn't happening before it actually happened. Um, the Supreme Court um, uh, essentially got rid of that or kind of gutted that provision. And so um, now the situation that we find ourselves in is that we're still advocating and, 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 and putting into place uh, the rules to make sure that uh, section two is in place. But uh, in the situation that we have now, um, it would be upon um, us to prove that um, that the that the redistricting process does exclude groups or is discriminatory against minority groups. Um, so that's the situation we're in now. Um, it does make it more difficult to protect against these practices um, because often, you know, it's litigated. It goes through court. It could take years. You know, the process might go a whole eight years and then. You know the the maps have to be redrawn, but by then there's all there's all already going to be another census, and then that whole process starts over again. So that's kind of the situation that we find ourselves in now, and um, I hopefully that kind of addressed uh, what you were talking about. No, 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 absolutely. You're both doing a very good job. I commend you. The the only thing that I was going to add is that that is why it's so important that minorities and people of color participate in this process because there still is a lot of packing and cracking, a lot of discrimination that takes place in the state of Arizona, and we have to rebuild the case so that Arizona can be designated again a pre because that makes it so much easier for people of color to be able to go to the Justice Department and, and, and file a grievance and ask for assistance. We've done it in the past, in, in decades, you know, in, in, in 1990 and 2000. So that is why what you both are doing right now is extremely important because we have to rebuild the case. So that's the only point I was hoping to clarify for those others that are listening that maybe have not previously been involved in redistricting and reapportionment. Thank you. Great, yeah, thank you for pointing that out. And that's really the point of, you know, we're trying to make sure that the public is informed and hopefully through that, we hold this process accountable. So thank you again for that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any uh, questions? I do see a question in the chat. I just want to read it out. This is from Kate. Um, it says here that there are a lot of people from all over Arizona. It's very exciting. What are the efforts to get voters mobilized to ensure that gerrymandering doesn't happen, especially if we get a 10th congressional district? It's a very good question. Um, we're gonna kind of go over that in, in the presentation here, but I think the main thing is making sure that Everybody's aware of the process, making sure that everybody's participating in the process. Part of that is making sure that, at least in Arizona, our independent redistricting commission is taking input from us. And we'll, we'll kind of go over that in, in these next slides. Um, but as long as we shine a light on the situation, um, people will respond to that. And um, hopefully we'll get good things out of that, that process. 
I just want to add real quick on that, um, that again, like Adi said, we will be going over it, but the biggest piece is advocacy and education. And so I think that's what we're trying to bring to the community. And with this, that's what we want you to bring to your communities. All right, here's, uh, we're, here we're gonna be talking about a little bit of Arizona's process. Um, Proposition 106. Proposition 106 in Arizona relates to ending the practice of gerrymandering and improving voter and candidate participation in elections by creating an independent commission of balance appointments to oversee the mapping of fair and competitive congressional and legislative districts. Um, because Arizona is a commission state, the, responsi the responsibility of drawing new congressional districts lies with this independent redistricting commission or IRC and not specifically elected officials. Um, this helps separate the possibly the negative effects of a commission drawn by a legislature because that legislature could be political or could be controlled by one party or the other, um, kind of what we saw with the Pennsylvania situation that we had mentioned before. The IRC is made up of five commissioners, um, two Republicans, two Democrats, and an independent <coughs> chair. Uh, so this is the beginning of the process in Arizona. There is a commission on the appellate court of appointments that conducts an application process for the IRC and nominates 25 possible commissioners. Um, Arizona legislative leaders appoint the first four commissioners. Specifically in this process, we have the majority leaders appoint and we also have the minority leaders. Um, in this case, currently how the legislator is set up um, that ends up that 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 brings us to two Republicans on the commission and also two Democrats. Um, and then after that process, the four uh, commissioners will appoint an independent chair. This process um, helps, in a way, take some of the politics out of the out of that uh, out of that situation. So hopefully, we have less uh, of those political issues affecting our process. All right, meet your commissioners. We have Republican uh, David Mel. We have Republican Douglas York, Democrat Shireen Lerner, Democrat Derek Watchman, and Independent Chair Erica Shupak Newberg. All right, and here's the IRC timeline again. Um, I want to emphasize that. Um, in the Arizona process, in the Arizona Constitution, uh, there's not a formal, uh, formal, for, formal uh, deadlines in this process. So it's a little tentative. Uh, some of the information here reflects how the process was done 10 years ago. Um, so we'll just run through this real quick. We have the five IRC commissioners. They have been appointed, and right now they're focusing on hiring staff and attorneys. Um, these commissioners may or may not hold public hearings before draft maps are drawn. Um, so holding public hearings are not in the actual constitution, but have been done uh, previously, and we're advocating that they're done again this time around. Um, the IRC after that uh, will unveil grid maps and start working on draft maps. Once the draft maps are completed, again, uh, there's, there has been in the past a second round of public hearings. Um, and then also uh, the part that is required is that they, they have to allow for 30 days of public comment. Again, it's important to remember that the public hearings aren't required, but have uh, occurred in the past. And again, we're uh, advocating for that. Once that process is over, the maps are then adopted and approved. And then just for a little bit of information, the apportionment and redistricting data has been delayed until September 2021. So that's gonna affect this timeline a bit. Um, per Prop 106, commissioners must start with a blank slate. The idea here is that when we're drawing the lines, uh, we're not to keep incumbents in a district 
to either protect them or draw around them. Um, grid maps must be drawn up that exclude party registration and voting history and data. Um, so we kind of uh, protect against any kind of political uh, type of gerrymandering in this process. Grid maps are just a starting point and do not account for all of the mapping criteria for Arizona. And grid maps use population to help make sure the districts are as compact and concrete as possible. So we don't have anything weird with the districts kind of really stretched out and are avoiding certain groups of people. And uh, uh, the mapping process makes adjustments based on the federal and state constitutional criteria. So on this very busy slide here, we have the Arizona mapping criteria. There are six of these. The first is that the core tenet of the drawing maps must comply with the US Constitution and the Voting Rights Act. Uh, Vote, Voting Rights Act. There must be purposeful inclusion in districts to make sure they're racially diverse, uh, have racially diverse communities, and that these communities have the opportunity to elect someone of their choosing in the district. Two, the district should have as close to an equal population as possible. For Arizona, uh, we're aiming to have no more than 10% difference between the districts with regards to population. Obviously, we can imagine how if we didn't have this rule, we could have a situation where maybe 90% of the population was in one district and the last 10% was divided into 10 little districts, maybe 10 representatives here and one representative here effectively uh, making the vote uh, less important of that group. So that's kind of why we have that rule. Uh, number three, compactness. Districts should be more compact and, con uh, and contiguous. Uh, boundaries are to be drawn closely, neatly packed together, and in, in a single in un in un interrupted shape. Number four, uh, communities of interest. Uh, district boundaries should respect communities of interest. Number five, geography. Districts should use visible graphical uh, geographic features, uh, cities, towns, county boundaries, and undivided census tracts. And the last criteria six is uh, the competitiveness aspect in a political manner. This should be favored when in doing so creates no significant detriment to all the other criteria or categories that we listed here. So now that we have talked about redistricting and talked about gerrymandering and the process in Arizona, the big question I think here is how can you get involved? So right now, as Adi said, we have the five commissioners have been appointed for the IRC. Again, that's David Neal, Douglas York, Shireen Lerner, Derek Watchman, and Erica Shupak Newberg. Right now, they are currently conducting what are called business meetings. Um, so in these meetings, they're discussing topics such as staffing, budgeting, interviews, um, job descriptions, uh, questions for lawyers, things like that. They are not talking uh, about um, maps and communities of interest at this time. Um, but there is still very many ways to advocate still. Uh, these meetings are every Tuesday at 9 a.m. And one of the biggest ways right now that we can advocate is for us and yourselves to encourage qualified individuals you may know to apply for these IRC positions. So right now they're hiring for executive director and executive staff assistant. And the reason we want to advocate for qualified individuals and individuals that we know um, is because this process is very serious. It involves our representation um, and really what our state is going to look like for the next 10 years. Um, the census is decennial. So um, we want these positions to be independent and nonpartisan because the executive director and all of these positions will work directly with the IRC to draw these district lines and boundaries. We also want to encourage the IRC to keep this hiring process transparent through public comment. 
to submit an official uh, to submit an official public comment. This must be done during one of the IRC meetings, so during their business meetings right now. I'm going to click here, and this is where. And um, we will be sending just a side note this presentation with these resources out um, after the event so you can have all of this um, at your fingertips. So here is right now what the Arizona redistricting.org looks like. I want to note that this isn't going to be the final Westing website for redistricting this cycle. This was actually last cycle. However, if you go to meeting info, you can always find the agenda 48 hours before the meeting. So you see today's meeting was uh, postponed till this March 2nd. So if you click on the agenda, it'll take you to the agenda and you can see all of um, the things they will be discussing. This first link here, this YouTube link is going to take you to their live stream. You can't access um, this live stream until it does start on the second. This second Google form here is how you are going to submit your public comment. So um, two really important things to know about public comment is that um, they allow it at every meeting and these business meetings and it opens right after the approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. Now this isn't always at the same time every week. So this is why we are encouraging you to watch these IRC meetings um, because it opens uh, then, and then it must be open for a minimum of 30 minutes, but can remain open until adjournment. I'm sorry for that technical difficulty. So just picking up where we were, um, that opportunity for public comment starts right after the approval from previous minutes is open for a minimum of 30 minutes and and can remain open until adjournment. Um, another important note, I'm sorry, is that your public comment must relate to topics on the agenda. Uh, so right now, um, one of the biggest things we can do is advocate for that transparent hiring process. Um, and encourage qualified individuals to apply. Other upcoming issues that may and will require advocacy, um, public hearings and testimonials that are transparent and accessible. As Aris mentioned earlier, part of that uh, tentative timeline is that public hearings will be held in two sessions. Last cycle, Arizona did hold two uh, series of public hearings. 53 in total were split between those two. And it was, those hearings were held throughout the state and more than 3,500 Arizonans either signed up to speak, submitted maps or participated online. So we want to advocate for at least this many hearings this cycle, if not more as well as that this process is accessible for the everyday Arizonan. So um, it takes into consideration people's schedules and what times they can attend the hearings. It may be um, ability for people to access virtually like we are now through YouTube. Um, if they, the commission decides they want to, to hold public hearings in person this year, what would that look like for COVID? So it's all kinds of these little things that we can advocate for throughout the process. And of course, we want to ensure that this process is inclusive of your communities of interest and your concerns, wherever you are and wherever you lie. Other ways to be uh, advocate on behalf of redistricting and to end gerrymandering that may not be an official public comment would be to submit a letter to the editor um, we do have a how to, uh, our education coordinator, Nick Medell, um, actually went through how to write a letter to the editor. So if you want to go to our YouTube and search raise Arizona, um, it'll pop up and it will, um, 
lead you straight to the letter to the editor video. Another way to be an advocate is to have a presence on social media. This could mean following orgs um, that share your same values and sharing and posting and liking um, their content and their messaging. It could be advocating on your own and creating your own messaging. Um, and it's just uh, engaging with your community um, and educating on that level. If and when available, um, one of the biggest ways to be an advocate for your community will be to testify at a public hearing. Um, at a public hearing, you can just testify uh, why you believe your community of interest is important. Um, you can always give an in, uh, input on how the map lines are drawn um, and you can uh, do some other things like that. And then of course, stay educated, stay up to date and spread the word. This process is very hard to understand, but it is so important to the work that we're going to do um, for our communities in the next few years. As Aris mentioned, I just wanna quickly note it again, the census delays um, will be until September. So we will not be even getting census data until September of this year which um, is another challenge on its own and might be another advocacy on issue on its own. Um, so we just wanna stay up to date and educated on all of this so we can in turn um, help others understand how important this process is. So I want to close it out by asking if there are any last questions. Drea, there is one question in the chat that you might have an answer to. Mary is asking, are the IRC meetings online via Zoom? No, they are on YouTube. So um, let me see if I can take you back to that slide. And um, I'm gonna go through that process again. So um, uh, Mary, it'll just be this YouTube link up here. Uh, I have um, been part like watching those IRC meetings and I can tell you that the YouTube is uh, pretty easy to use. You just don't have, they don't see you and you you can see them, um, but it's, it's, it hasn't given me problems, but it isn't through Zoom, it's through YouTube. And they don't have a channel. If you want to watch previous meetings, you can go to that meeting information tab and they'll have um, those videos on there. Are there any last questions? Um, my question, um, you mentioned about, if we know people who could work for this committee to tell them, where do we like find information about that to share? and to know like what the qualifications are. Sure, so that's part of the resources that we will be sending out in the follow-up email. It'll be a direct link to the executive director um, requirements and application, as well as a direct link to the executive staff assistant um, requirements and application. Yeah. And those, I believe they will be closing on February 26th, those positions. So you should get that email um, with those resources tomorrow. Okay, that's soon, cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, we had another question. Um, it's just, is Ray's gonna be doing, um, you guys can hear me, right? Is Ray's gonna be doing any additional trainings to advocate for communities as the hearings are set? Um, yes, definitely. Once the commission is getting closer to allowing for the public hearings to happen, uh, we're hoping that uh, and working towards making sure that the community communities of interest here, especially in Pinal County, are, are uh, going to be to advocate for themselves. So whenever that process starts, uh, hopefully uh, ourselves and hopefully other, other groups uh, are going to reach out to these communities and make sure that they're aware of the process. And if there's a specific, uh, if, the, if the hearings are held at specific places, or if people need to be able to jump on Zoom calls, 
uh, we want to be able to help out with that so that uh, those people can make their voices heard and, and kind of have an impact on the process. So we are definitely looking to do that. Um, somebody asked a question about, oh, I'm losing it here. Somebody asked a question about LD16, which includes Pinal County and Mesa. Um, as Queen Creek explodes into LD16 in East Mesa and in Maricopa, um, I think the question might be, is it likely to be peeled into another legislative district? Um, honestly, I, I'm not sure what that process is, what that's going to look like. Um, it's kind of, yeah, it's just, I, it starts off with a blank slate and then we'll go from there. But I guess if you have any concerns um, for whatever reason of your community, um, hopefully you can advocate for how that process is going to look. Hopefully that, um, that makes sense. Yeah, and I just want to jump in on that because no um, census data has been released and because Arizona is a blank slate state, um, because we start with that blank slate, there's no way to know um, off the bat how we will be grouped. Um, but uh, that's why that first round and second round of public hearings and public comment is so important because that is where you will advocate for your community of interest. Um, and just several ways, like we had mentioned, were public comment. Um, as we get further into the process, um, there is also um, other things you can do, such as uh, maybe mapping um, and testifying, as Adi said. But right now, it's so early in the process that we can't really say who will be grouped where and um, how those district boundaries are going to be drawn. Awesome. Yeah, and I just want to add, um, and I haven't had a chance to really look at it a whole lot because I'm not a, maybe a cartographer, um, but there are some interesting mapping software out there and we'll uh, provide some links to those. Some of those cost money, but some of them are, are free. And also somebody asked about uh, the reference links and making sure that, that we have these available. So we'll make sure to put, uh, give you guys the websites or the links when we send out uh, the slides to you guys. Um, did anybody else have any questions? All right, so with that, I want to thank you all for joining us. It was, I know a lot of information, but you um, all asked very good questions. Like I said, you will be receiving an email tomorrow with the presentation as well as the websites and the links we discussed and the two job descriptions that are currently up. Uh, so just, uh, if you are out of state, um, you may not have an independent redistricting commission in your state, you, or you might have another type of commission or your legislature might draw your lines. So if you are out of state, um, you might want to read up on your own redistricting process. If not, um, you can always visit raise.org um, and sign up to volunteer or submit a form that way. So again, I just want to thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I had a great time and I hope you learned something, a little something. And um, again, have a great, great and wonderful evening. Goodbye, everybody.